Hey internet, I'm Simon Squibb, your host at the Good Luck Club podcast. Our mission is to help anybody out there that's thinking of starting a business do just that. Equally, if you've started a business and are struggling, maybe you need a little bit of inspiration and knowledge. And we hope by interviewing some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs and change makers that you'll get the knowledge you need to become the person you want and turn your business into that dream company. I personally have started 17 companies from scratch and have invested in over 65 startups. I left school at 15 with near zero education and was able to retire at 40. When I sat down and analyzed how I did it, I discovered a secret. It was all luck. So in each episode, I'm here to tell you, in my opinion, no matter what you're building, shipping or thinking, without luck, it ain't gonna work. Each week, I will discuss with my guests this theory and test it and see if luck is a skill as I feel it is and if it's possible to pass it on to the next generation of entrepreneurs. I hope you enjoy our episode this week. Welcome to episode 19. Thanks for joining us, lucky people. Today's guest is Carolyn Cowan. Carolyn is a lifetime entrepreneur. She's a trained psychosexual and relationship therapist and a yoga teacher, teacher trainer, among other things. Before becoming a therapist, Carolyn was a fashion designer and photographer and earned acclaim as a makeup artist in the pop music video industry. Carolyn, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to have you here. So I always like to start the podcast off by asking this one simple question of what is success for you? Okay, I like the question. And I think that I don't have um, a single word answer or a single sentence. I think obviously, for me as a single parent, I'm divorced with two older children now, but they're still living at home. I think it's financial independence. So that makes my life much simpler. Um, I think that success for me as a person with my history is... um, to be able to hold myself emotionally, to be able to manage myself emotionally, to have a personal daily practice. And I think above all, um, that I only do things that I really love in terms of work. So I think, um, I'm, you know, I'm 60, so I'm really happy that I can have a big garden and I can grow vegetables and I can keep bees, you know, that kind of thing where I feel I'm contributing I'm participating, I'm embedded in nature, I'm not lost in the internet, which is currently really what's happening with COVID virus, is we're lost in the internet. So success is made up of lots of different things, actually. I think part of it is independence, financial independence, but I think a lot of it is my own relationship to myself and to nature, for me. In a business frame, do you give yourself yourself a target in business or is it is how do you measure whether your business is successful or not oh, that's a really interesting question i mean i've i've been self-employed i had one job um many 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 years ago when i was 19 i briefly worked i worked for two weeks in habitat cafe in the king's road that was an absolute nightmare mm-hmm. and i worked for a couple of months for a clothes designer in the king's road called anthony price and that's the only time i've had a paid job The rest of the time I've been self-employed. So my entire life has been self-employed. And when I was younger, I worked in the film industry and that was extremely random. And I would spend the money before I earned it, you know, that kind of thing, get a big job and then go crazy and spend the money. And I've had real issues with money in my life. So I think that now having over the last nine years retrained, really refocused what I do. I'm much more aware of how I am doing well based on setting myself targets. So in the pre-discussions with you, I mentioned the thousand true fans. So I do use this model, which initially asks you, what do you need? How much money do you actually need? So I find that really interesting. If I ask myself, how much money do I need? I can look at what I need. And at the moment, I think I've arrived at a point where I don't really need that much more than I have. So it makes it more relaxing because I know what I want and I know how to get what I want based on what I'm capable of doing. So it's a quite an interesting balancing act. So now I can measure how I'm doing by um, 
attendance at workshops? How much am I giving away free? Am I giving away enough free to balance the more expensive stuff? So I try to have a very um, generous offering always on Vimeo and YouTube and free classes, that kind of stuff, which means that then also that balances out with where I actually earn money. I don't know if that answered your question, but I measure my success. I work hard, but I also am comfortable. It does answer my question, and it makes me think of another one, which basically, I, I always, when I was younger in business, I used to always hear these sayings, things like, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get, for example, which, which I don't believe in. Also, this concept that, you know, if you give something for free, it's not valued. And I have an opinion on it, but I'm wondering what your opinion is on, on statements like that. You know, you're, you're, you're giving away, you're, you're measuring your success in business by how much you can give for free, which I love, by the way, for any listeners out there, um, you know, first time entrepreneurs or people thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, I actually think that's an amazing benchmark. But, but what do you think about, you know, free? Do people value it? How, how, what's the perception of free? I mean, I was going to say between you and I, but of course this isn't between you and I, but uh, it's, it's COVID time, so it's lockdown. I made an offer just as it all blew up, and I kind of, you know, not like I'm intuition or, you know, I'm some magic person, but you could see it wasn't going to go well. And so before it really kicked off into lockdown, I offered four free classes. Uh, I didn't say I'm going to teach every Monday or I'm going to teach every day. I said I'll offer four free classes over Easter. I put that out on my social media, and honestly – honestly, hand on my heart, I had 1,300 people ask to join the four free classes. So fantastic. You know, I upped my Zoom. I've invested money in better headphones, better speaker, making sure I invested money in the platform and gave these classes. And actually, they went really well. The uh, I had a massive mess up on the first day where my Zoom was only set to 100 and I didn't realize, even though I'd upped, blah, blah, blah. But I literally had well over a thousand people over the days. And um, that was a really amazing experience. What's been fantastic is the response I've had, but also a lot of people have looked at my offer. And my offer is on my website and I have workshops, I have trainings. And so people have then joined my mailing list, want to hear from me and have signed up for things. So that for me is, I would consider that to be a successful offer. Plus, I've had amazing emails where people have, you know, really gained from the series and passed it on. And so every morning I'm answering loads and loads of emails from people. And and that's really nice. It feels like there's a community. It feels like there's connection. Hmm. Um, It feels like a valid offering, which I like. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can relate exactly to what you're talking about. I mean, myself, I think I've always built businesses that were about making money. My idea being that you could then afford to pay people well, and that would provide people with things that they need in life. But I've been doing these podcasts for free. And people have come to me to do sponsorship and pay. And I've said no, because I wanted to keep it pure and keep it without a catch, without a, a, a soft sell for something other than the pure information that I'm trying to give people out there. But there is an interesting perception that somehow if if you do something for free, it doesn't have value. And what you just said there, which I think is a good insight for anybody listening, is in a way, it's also a way of you marketing yourself in a way. Um, it, 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 and just being you know, honest about it, there's, an, there's, a, there's a marketing piece there. And that's good. That's value for you. And that equals the value you're giving to other people. And I think a lot of the time people see free as bad. But I think free is actually very powerful. You, the whole kind of give five, ask for one, right? So you give people five things for free and then you ask for something, you know, one thing yeah. back. And I think people are more willing to do it if you, if you do it that way. Yes. So and I, think, I, think, I think it is interesting. I mean, I know that you're, you're in yourself, you're, you know, you're known, you're successful, you, you know, the things you've done are, are, are big. And, 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 and I think also... I'm aware that as a woman, and particularly as an older woman and fairly non-conforming woman, it's important to, um, the thing I've found has made a huge difference for me is in my absolute humanity. I don't, I don't try to be perfect. You said pure, you used the word pure, and it made me very aware of, you know, I've always come from a place of humanity. I'm an ex-drug addict, I'm an ex-alcoholic, I'm an ex-gambler. I've been, you know, I've lost everything in my life twice. And um, I mean, literally everything. And 
And I think that ability to recognize one's humanness, to be the age I am, I would never have plastic surgery. You know, I am exactly what I am. And I don't, I don't find that that remotely limits me or holds me back. But what it does is it gives people permission. So for me, the purity is actually in the inclusivity rather than the exclusivity. Mm. And the inclusivity is the breadth of the offer. I like inclusive as opposed to exclusive. I think in the world we're living in today, that's very powerful. You know, how, mm. how can you include people? I think sometimes pricing things out. I mean, entrepreneurs out there, a lot of my listeners are entrepreneurs trying to, or people that want to become entrepreneurs that are learning, hopefully, from, from our experience. But to give people the chance to be included is a very powerful thing. I guess free gives people the chance to be included. Sometimes when you charge a lot, and of course we all value our, 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 our offering, you can exclude people that perhaps need help, right? For example yeah yes you can and, and uh, you know i'm not only a yoga teacher i'm also a psychotherapist mm. at the moment you know i retrained and i'm a as you mentioned at the, i think we talked between us i'm a psychosexual and relationship therapist specializing in trauma addiction blah 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 blah, blah mm. lots of things and um i i i run workshops i run trainings i do lectures and i talk at free trauma events and things like that so i give information i run workshops to help people understand but i don't give away my client services for mm. free that's mm. something that i value my time mm. and that does mean that i have a pro rata scale but it does mean that, you know people write to me and say i can't afford you and it's not fair that you won't be won't do it for free I, I can't do it for free. Mm. It's not appropriate to do it mm. for free. Right. Do, and people, actually, do people really write to you and say that? Free. That's so cheeky. Huh? People write to you and say, I want it for free. People write and say all sorts of things, my darling. Uh. I, work, I work mostly in the yoga community, which is a very particular community. And mm. interestingly, you know, as a normal figured older woman, I don't fit the Instagram meme, you know, of mm. let me stand on a rock in Bali and mm. tight leggings and take a picture of me doing this perfect posture. Mm. And what's really interesting within that really formulaic structure of what success looks like, because success is being able to say no, to be super thin, mm. to be super beautiful. The power is in actually, you know, that's a tiny percentage of the population. I'm, I'm extremely human. It opens it up to so many people. Mm. So I'm, I'm saying that relative to your your perspective of being an entrepreneur, I think people can, I mean, you know, I know people who want to be super wealthy. I know people who want to be super, super rich and, you know, hedge fund and property and all of those kind of traditional routes. And it is interesting in the yoga world because there's quite a judgment against being successful. Mm. I think people get jealous. I don't really understand. Somehow we, we are expected to give it away for free, mm. but actually all so in the weird purity and perfection of how people think they're supposed to look out of exclusivity, which means there are hundreds of thousands of people who are excluded. And so actually you can turn around to all of those people and they're the most enormous audience, all of whom want to be included. And that's the space I work in. Mm. Well, thank you for being in that space because I think I'm one of those people too. And uh, I'm, I, I always fear yoga. I want to do it, but I'm always scared that I'm not going to be perfect at it. And every class looks beyond a beginner. So it, there's always that feeling that you can't, you're, you're excluded, um, which, which... Yes, and I think that's one of the failings that, that yoga has is it's become, especially because of social media, it's become so exclusive and it shouldn't be. Mm. I think that's what's nice about doing something like that now because... You can do it at home and nobody can see your belly and nobody mm. can see what your leggings look mm. like. And does mm. my bum look big in this? Who cares? Mm. It's actually very liberating. Mm. It's interesting because I, I can relate to your story on so many levels. I, uh, I don't drink alcohol at all because I'm scared I would be addicted if I did because I've got an addictive personality. Um, and and uh, I, I also, you know, on the other end of the scale, there's an element in business for me where... I feel like everyone can be an entrepreneur, but it's become this exclusive, special thing that only you know super techie or super outgoing people can be entrepreneurs. And of course, that's not true. There's there's eight different profiles of humans, and there's actually eight different profiles of entrepreneurs. It's just you know where do you fit within the equation? So it's a bit like you're saying with the leggings at home you can do yoga now there's an opportunity for people to dive in i feel the same way about business i was just looking at the unemployment numbers coming out of the us you know six million people unemployed when i see that number i think 
that's six million people that could start a business. You know, but unfortunately, everyone thinks it has to be a brilliant idea or it has to be Facebook or it has to be Zoom. They, they can't... It's unplugging from that fake world of this kind of super... Like, your point about yoga, people are beautiful and perfect. And, you know, so people look at the uh, startup world the same way. Look at Mark Zuckerberg. He's a billionaire and he, he's clever and he's techie and therefore he's able to do it. That's not true. A lot of people can just start a business. You've been an entrepreneur your whole life. Mm -hmm. So, you know... Yeah. Do you ever feel that you would like to have been employed? Do you ever do you ever wonder what that would be like now? No, I'm a nightmare. I'm a nightmare. I mean, you know, you, you never want me on a course because I'm an evil cow on a course. I'm not a peer. I mean, you mentioned um, you mentioned personality types, and I don't know if you're talking about Myers Briggs or if you're talking about Diamond Mind. There's different ways of looking at personality types. Enneagrams is another one. I'm not a peer. I mean, I am not a peer. I am definitely, you know, I remember going to New Zealand many, many years ago and thinking of moving there and realizing that very quickly, if I went to New Zealand, I'd end up running it. <laughs> I mean, and not that I think I'm so fabulous, but I'm just one of those people. I'm not right. a peer. Right. I am not a peer. Hmm. It's not in my nature to be a peer. And it's very interesting to be a teacher as well. And I have, you know, workshops and things that happen with people. I, I am not a peer. I'm mm. definitely a leader, and that's mm. my nature. Mm. And I think it's interesting to work out, you know, when you think about setting yourself up as an entrepreneur, you've got to work out your skills. Mm. And I do all my own finances. I don't do my accounts, but, you know, I do all my own um, numbers on workshops. I do all my own texts for writing. I do all my own pictures for artwork. But I know the edges. I cannot create or design artwork i cannot run a website you know i cannot do certain things and so i employ the people to do what i can't do mm. and i know what i'm good at so that's a, i think that's a really interesting thing is to begin first of all bit by bit i don't believe you get it right first off but it's to get a real sense of your skills mm. are you a people person mm. you know i'm good with people i'm good with intimacy i'm good with creating i'm charismatic and i'm funny and i'm anarchic and I'm really good at creating connection between people so I can hold a group of people and they'll connect amazingly. And I have no need to be their friend. Mm. So I don't come into it wanting to be one of them. I come into it going, you are all going to make an amazing group and I'm going to be here for you. So have that's you, my skill. Have you always been that way? How, when did you realize your skills? When did you? Because a lot of the time people are told to work on the things that they're not good at, right? So, you know, like it, it, if you see staff reviews type situations, yeah. it's like, you're really good at this, but you need to improve in this, this, and this. And often they might not be the areas you're particularly skilled at or good at, right? So, but how did you discover this about yourself? In, in um, before I got sober, I crashed in, uh, I crashed in 1991. So I went into recovery from drugs and alcohol in 1991. And I was working in the film industry and I had arrived at a point where I was really seriously struggling with what I was doing. I was good at what I was doing, but I was hating Photoshop as it came in. Photoshop is a, is a software that people say, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll do it on Photoshop. And it was just dismantling my skills. And I really hated it. And also, you know, I was doing jobs that I wasn't enjoying. I was just, I really, really hated what I was doing. And I, and I got sober. I was working in Ireland on a shoot and uh, I was taking, you know, I was having Coke in the toilet at three o'clock in the morning before I went to make up this rock star, you know, turned up, had a double espresso, lit a cigar and then said, okay, let's do it. Let's do your makeup. And then he said, I think you have a problem. She's like, you have no idea. Mm. Anyway, this person turned out to be David Bowie <laughs> and David Bowie took me to my first NA meeting in Dublin. And that was how I got sober. So lucky me, but actually it was really pretty, um, it was pretty overwhelming, not, not because it was him, but just because of stopping drinking and taking drugs was really hard. And at that point, because I stopped drinking and taking drugs that day, and I haven't drunk or taken drugs since, what happened to my career was that everybody who used to employ me, because I was a crazy maniac, I was working for people, you know, Freddie Mercury, Duran Duran, I was doing all pop videos and commercials. Nobody would employ me because all of the people that were doing the naughty stuff didn't trust me anymore. And I lost everything. I literally lost everything. I bought a flat in Clapham. Margaret Thatcher was in power. The interest rate went up to 27.5%. I mean, where we are now, 
now it's half a percent. And literally overnight, I lost my relationship. I lost my flat. Um, I had nothing. I got knighted. The last job I did, one of the last jobs I did was a job in Yemen, interestingly. Uh, I go into Yemen to do an American Express commercial, the irony of all of it. And while I was in Yemen, I got burgled and everything I owned got taken. So I was one month sober in Yemen. My flat was burgled. I had nothing, came back, lost everything and ended up living in a bedsit, having to beg an ex-boyfriend to pay my rent for me. Best thing ever happened to me. Mm. I literally had nothing. And the irony was that the person I asked to pay my rent, when I had left him when I was 20, I had left with a five pound note and a dress, a dress. And that was it. That was all I'd left him with. And I'd started again. And then here I was in 1991. So 11 years later, back at zero. And it was an amazing thing. It was an amazing thing to, it's just, you know, I decided at that point, so I'm still answering your question. I decided at that point, I would only do things that I wanted to do. I would only do things that I liked. I knew I was charismatic. I knew I was big as a person. And I just decided from here on in, I'm only going to do things that I want to do and that I like. And I think if you don't do that, you've got nothing. I think it's just hideous. Mm. Amazing was, story. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away <laughs> by your story. But it, it resonates with me so much. And I, and I, want, the, I want the listeners to understand some of the amazing things that you're saying there i think one element that i'm going to pull out is you there you are you know with nothing and in the same breath you're saying it was the most amazing thing to happen to me that was fantastic yeah but you see i think a, a lot of people i mean even now with the coronavirus nightmare going on for a lot of people you know when you're in the middle of it i'm sure at that moment you didn't think that but you've kind of over time appreciated the moment is is that fair to say no, I think, I think that, you know, it was interesting. It was challenging. I found getting sober really hard because I drank to forget. Mm. I wasn't one of those people that drank so that I was hilariously funny. I mean, I was funny, but I drank to forget. And so when I stopped drinking, I remembered. Uh. <laughs> that was funny. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and getting sober is, it's, you know, a lot of people now in COVID time, they're really struggling with their addictive nature. I mean, you know, everybody will tell you how much weight they're gaining and how much they're eating. Let's talk about that for a moment. Mm. But... You know, getting sober is challenging. I found losing everything was actually quite a relief. Mm. It gave me the opportunity because I think what also happens is that sometimes you get tied into things. You get tied into things because of the money. You know, you've got a mortgage. You've got responsibility. You want that car, blah, blah, blah. So if you, if you, you can't give up your job, you can't change what you're doing. So for mm. me, losing everything was just like, oh, so I, at that time, I made this really mad decision. I thought, I, I want to be a photographer. I've always wanted to be a photographer. I had 500 pounds left in an account for VAT at that point. So I took the VAT money. I went and I bought a secondhand Hasselblad, which is a particular kind of car camera. So I bought a Hasselblad. I rang up Ilford, and, who made film at the time. You know, it was still the time of film. It was 1991. And I said, I'm going to India and photograph nomads. Could you give me some film? And they said, sure. Fantastic. Okay. I mean, they didn't know me from Adam, but they gave me loads of film. It all arrived in a big bag. And I went to India to photograph nomads. And I literally got to Bombay Airport and I thought, major flaw in this plan. I have no idea where the nomads are. <laughs> <laughs> I had the most amazing time. I spent four or five months that trip. And I ended up uh, photographing nomads in Gujarat, which is an which was at the time the most extraordinary state in India, and I did these I did these amazing portraits of nomads. Really, really, they were. I mean, I was a good photographer, luckily, and I did these really good pictures. And then the Independent did a feature with me with twenty seven of my pictures, and I became a photographer. And um, you know, and then I have changed in you know several incarnations since then. And then I became a clothes designer because being a photographer, I didn't enjoy very much. So, and now here I am a yoga teacher and a therapist. So I think when you lose everything, it allows things to open up. I think that's uh, so true. Do you look at things in a kind of good luck, bad luck context at any stage? I think somebody told me a very long time ago that I was a rat, you know, in that Chinese horoscope. Yep, of course. So, and actually, interestingly, here I am at 60. So this year is the metal rat. So yes. I've done a full loop. Yep. I'm back in being a metal rat. 
and and they said it they said it as if being a rat was a pejorative thing you know like a negative thing and i thought no actually i'm extremely opportunistic gypsy mm. and i will always see opportunity you know that thing of if life mm. gives you lemons make lemonade yeah i will see op- i'm very good at seeing opportunity and mm. and somehow I was talking with my daughter yesterday. We were we were watering the garden and we were looking at the vegetables and we were talking about this series I just ran. And I said, do you know what the zeitgeist is? And she said, I think I know what the zeitgeist is. The zeitgeist is the ability to pick up what the universe needs, to see in advance what the universe needs. And some of us who want to be entrepreneurs need to learn to tune into what the universe needs. Does that make sense? Total sense. To see I'm... opportunity. And you know, I, for me, it kind of, it's like little, it's as if you can see the universe ahead of you in perspective and you can see little threads coming down and you can choose and you can go, actually, I think that if I do that, that is going to work. I'm going to go that way. That's going, That's what the universe needs. So, you know, I've focused over the years on things like shame or addiction and it's been what the universe has needed mm. because they're my skills. And I think that, I think that, in our humanity, I think we want to be perfect and we want to look really good and all that stuff. But actually, in our humanity, we hold a huge amount of gold. So I'm an ex-drug addict. My history is traumatic. I'm an ex-gambler. I am, you know, I've had interesting experiences with children. All of that stuff is what I do as a therapist. So all of that stuff is what I do as a teacher. I use my own experience to um, create moving forward. I don't shy away from my negative experiences. For me, they're the the grist, the fodder. It's fascinating listening to you because um, very charming. No, well, <laughs> it, it, because you know, I, I can. I, I want people to understand out there that are thinking of becoming an entrepreneur or are entrepreneurs right now struggling. That in that struggle is the joy. Yeah. And, and and listening to you and what you've been through and what you've done, it kind of the journey makes you who you are, hmm. right? And so you know when you when you're talking about these things, I'm just wondering if a listener out there that's thinking of becoming an entrepreneur can grasp it. I want them to grasp it, and I think they're seeing the opportunity in in all the difficult things. You see, what I've just seen with, if, if I throw out a message, oh, there's opportunity in this coronavirus right now, it can come across as capitalistic. I know, and, and people, it's really upset. Yeah, and people misunderstand, I think, what op, op, uh, optimist, or I'm going to say proactive entrepreneurs are, are trying to say in that statement. No one wants this to have happened. I'm sure you didn't want to be a drug addict. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you, didn't, you didn't want to have those things happen to you. But in the, uh, the let's say, the, the, the difficulty or the, or the challenge that was set in front of you is opportunity. Yes, I think, what, what, I think part of the work is to transform poison into nectar. It's an alchemical right. process where you don't reject yourself. I think that going back to the purity and the perfection, which is where you began, I think that we have a tendency to think we should be something else. I mean, mm. I wish I was thinner, but that's not going to happen. Mm. But I also can wish I wasn't a drug addict or I can go, well, actually, I know an enormous amount about addiction. Mm. You know, I remember going and doing a training in addiction and it's just like, you have no fucking idea. You <laughs> do not know what you're talking about. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. I said to the teacher at the time, I said, were you a drug addict? And she said, no. Well, then what the fuck are you doing teaching me? <laughs> you know? I mean, excuse me. Yeah. I, I, have that problem, I have that problem with life coaches, you know, a little bit. Yes. I, a little bit. Like I, I, someone said to me when I, when I retired, I, you know, oh, you, should, you should speak to a life coach about what to do next. I'm like, and then I met this. And the age wasn't the issue. I, I believe in old souls. It was nothing, nothing to do with their age. It was just that they hadn't actually taken any risks or, or, or done anything that I think can teach you about life. You know, and so when life coaches haven't taken any risk, I find it very hard to take uh, advice. <laughs> no, it's true. And I think also that, you know, part of your portfolio, or part of my portfolio is that, you know, I've run businesses. I've, I've, I've skirted with bankruptcy for 10 years. I was mm. literally avoiding bankruptcy one day at a time. Mm. I've lost everything. I've had businesses collapse. I've gone into monumental amounts of debt. I mean, you know, I mean, for me, monumental. I mean, mm. probably in the big scheme of what Trump can do, it's nothing. Mm. But mm. personal debt, mm. I mean, 
you know, I've learned, mis- learned, 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 learned. I have a list of things I will never do mm. again. Mm. But I also have a huge amount of stuff that is just like somebody might say, you should do this. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for letting me know what you think I should do. But do I want to do that? I'll consider it. Uh, I don't, don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, advice is interesting, isn't it? That, that's part of why I'm doing this podcast, because, you know, I have my opinions about things and I tell people these opinions. And then what I want to caveat that with is, you know, you've got to listen to other people's views, but have your own. Mainly, you've got to have your own view, right? That like that goes back to your point earlier, I think, which about knowing yourself, what you're good at, and what what your strengths are, what you enjoy. So many people don't ask themselves what they actually enjoy, don't you think? Yeah, and am I enjoying it? Right. They're just going yeah. for the motions of doing it. Um, and you know the whole very English thing, I think, where you say, "You know, how are you doing?" It's kind of the opening statement. Most people are like, "Yeah, I'm doing fine." The underlining. I hate my job, I hate my life, and I'm doing nothing about it, Tone. Well, you know what fine is? It's a euphemism for fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> Everything that is fine to me is just like, okay. I've not heard that before, but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you, you should make that into a T-shirt and sell it online. Yeah. I think, I think that, um, you know, I think that... I think something that... Um, I think you've got to find your skills. You've got to work out what you're good at. And I think you've got to work out where your gold lies. I think that's a really interesting thing is, you know, if your background is in, let's imagine, I don't know, depression or or cancer or, you know, um, a version of madness, there's so much you can offer when Mm. you come to terms with it and you don't reject it. Mm. I don't, I don't person, I mean, I've had, I remember buying property in the uh, 90s and I was buying property at 27 and a half percent return, which if you're an entrepreneur, you probably know what that means. Um, and I fucked it up completely, and I got into so much debt. And I had, at one point, you know, I had £800,000 worth of personal mortgages, which was actually really stressful with two children. And and I gradually kept selling property to pay off the debts, and then, of course, ended up not having the money to pay the capital gains. And in the end, I just thought, I can't do this, so I got rid of all of it and went bankrupt, uh, almost bankrupt. So, so for me, I know that I'm shit at that. I know that's not how I want to run my life. I don't want to be looking at bills. I don't like bills. I don't want to look at bills. I don't Mm. want to be running around worrying about somebody else's boiler. I don't care. Mm. I'm a great communicator. I'm a great, you know, I am a leader. But I also don't want to be supremely famous out there in public because I don't want to be taken down. So Mm. I come back around to the thousand true fans and find a way of a niche market that suits my financial needs. Yeah, I, your story, I, I, I do you know why I've just, again, realized why I like hearing your story so much. It's because I think our lives might have been somehow paralleled. Because my, <laughs> my parents lost everything in the 1990 interest rate spike, similar mm-hmm. thing, bought lots of property. It's fascinating what you're saying. You know what? I, I just, again, I want to highlight to anyone that's, that's listening right now. Um, first of all, I normally keep this podcast to 25 minutes, but I can't stop talking to you so we're just going to keep going until until uh, you want to stop but okay. I, I i i think there's an element here that's again very important i'm talking to a lot of young people that mm-hmm. are looking to start businesses and they have an urge to start a business and the idea they pitch to me most often is buy property <laughs> and and i don't know if they've been sold online courses or, or what it is but it just you know how to make money yeah, buy property book, make a million in three make years a million yeah year. mortgage buy lend interest rates are low and you know i don't know why history repeats itself i don't know why people don't listen to the wise words of my parents the wise words of what you're talking about you know like follow what you love doing i think is what i take away from what you're saying but i think a lot of people might just hear the story that you had lots of property in the 90s and sold it. And, and I think what if people might be accidentally engaging the wrong part of their brain when they hear that, and they might be hearing, wow, if you kept on to that property, you'd you know, you'd be a billionaire today. Yeah, what, exactly. And what they're missing, and I think the point I want to make sure they don't miss, is that you're happy with your life because you're doing what you love every day. And, and, and if you had 100 properties today then you'd be making sure their boilers work in those houses and managing a bunch of bills every day, whether it's the agents that are managing those properties or you indirectly, and you wouldn't be doing what you love every day. No, and you'd be going and you'd be clearing up after tenants who were sconded and left the place trashed. And, you know, I mean, absolutely hideous, absolutely, completely 
hideous lifestyle. And I work a lot with people who, who have these property portfolios mm. and their risk management portfolio, their risk is terrifying. Mm. And how they're gambling. Mm. I, don't, I don't gamble anymore, which is one of the reasons I don't... Yeah. I have no interest in doing that because it is a gamble and it is so stressful and mm. actually it is so hideous. Mm. That level of debt is is uh, is really really frightening. If you call think, people, um, if you call people doing that a gambler, they'd be insulted. But it is gambling, and I, I guess I'm trying to make sure my listeners understand this. That you know, I'm not saying don't do a property business. If you love property, actually, I like property. Don't you know? But I, I think if you you know, be careful. You don't get confused between having an interest in something and end up doing something to make money and end up hating it. You know, I think a lot of people fall into that. It's a form of addiction that they don't realize they're falling yeah, into. But the risk is also a form of addiction. Mm. This is the other side of that. And that's fine. I mean, we're not here to talk about addiction and it's not my job to tell anyone how to behave at all. No. But I think that one of the things that um, I work with a lot, particularly for myself, is that there is a universal energy, whether you believe in it or not. I believe in a universal mm. energy. And if I wake up each morning and I say, I hate my life, I have nothing. My life is shit. Why can't I be successful? The universe goes, hey, no problem. We can do that. And if you wake up in the morning and you go, I love my life and my life loves me and I feel like I can generate and I can join in and create and generate, the universe goes, hey, we can do that. No problem. With equal peace. And I think that you have more part in what you put out than you think. I mean, I know you name it as luck. For me, I think that it is about, um, I think it's about diving deep into who you are and what you've been through, finding out what your skills are, and then finding out how to utilize them in, in a way that brings you pleasure. Because otherwise you're on a rat race, otherwise you're on a treadmill, otherwise you're just going to explode in stress like a machine or a robot that blows up. And that's not funny. You know, I think it's got to be able to be at times hilariously funny, incredibly iconic or moments that are just absolutely amazing and thrilling. And at the same time, there's nothing wrong with a learning curve. But I think if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then I think your life is just really hard. Then why is it 90 percent of people will say they don't enjoy what they what they do every day? Because I think all they do is they chase the money. I always blame Margaret Thatcher, you know. <laughs> I think that she started this thing of chasing money. She really, really started this thing of credit and being able to have more than you did and, you know, credit cards. And, and suddenly money became more important than anything else. And, you know, going back to your first question about success, I think, you know, being able to bear yourself and be yourself and be with yourself and, and enjoy yourself. We get distracted by this idea that we should be something else and that something else is wealthy. And I think wealth is a byproduct because actually, you know, enjoying the process, you've got to enjoy the, you've got to enjoy the path, you've got to enjoy the walk. It can't just be a mountain at the other end that you'll kill to get to, because that's just or you'll be killed because it's the stress levels that people experience are just not not good. I couldn't agree more. I mean, my version of that is I always say to people, money will only make you happy if you're already happy. Yeah. Because otherwise, you've got the problem of managing it. Right. Well, that's it. Keeping it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you don't. Yeah, that's so true. And it's not. Um, I mean, I, unfortunately, I've tried to translate this message. It would be interesting to debate it with you. I tried to translate this message to, to young folks that don't have money, that mm. money's not important. But when they don't have it, they've not experienced having it. You've had your highs and lows. I've had my highs and lows. And, you know, you, the, the whole. But you kind of need those things maybe to realize like my ambition when I was 20 was to own a nice car. And then when I actually owned that nice car, I found over time it owned me. First week was nice. Second week, I'm like, oh, no, it's got a scratch. What should I do? Second week, it needed its tires changed. And then I needed to fill it up with petrol. And next thing you know, I'm looking after this thing. I know. I had a really, really fantastic sort of proper shiny fuck off Land Rover. I spent my whole life expecting someone to steal it. It right. was so stressful. I know, I know. So, But I, but I feel like you need to own that Land Rover, have that experience to realise it. Yeah. How, is there an easier way to help people understand this than just, you know, like I'm going to call it uh, wise, wise older people telling younger people, oh, this is the way you should live. Is there a better way if listeners are out there thinking about possessions, how to, how to remove that from the equation? 
I don't know. I mean, I think I think it's interesting, isn't it? I think you go through a series of things. You think you want to be this. You think you want to do that. And I think that it's part of the process. Mm. But I think perhaps in listening to you and I, perhaps it makes it easier to bear the losses. Perhaps it makes it easier to, to face the failures that inevitably have to come mm. because they're the things that give you the list of things you will never do again. Mm. Plus, they give I, you the they're the most exciting things story-wise, aren't they? The and failures, stories, yeah, yeah. So, you, uh, yeah, I, 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 I would love to figure out a formula. Maybe we could, we could talk about this you know, offline outside the podcast another time. How to help people out there understand how unimportant money is, and not mm. just from a perspective of, you know, we're comfortable, so we can say that, you know, but more like, ha- you know, you can be happy without money, and this is how you know, some steps, some practical ways of thinking about it because people are obsessed with money. And I, I don't know if I blame Margaret Thatcher. I'm, I might blame um, capitalism. Um, well, she was the sort of beginner of it, wasn't she? That's why I blame her because I yeah. remember that. Whole it's, thing. Interesting. it's interesting you mentioned credit cards. I was just looking at the history of credit cards and I think it was um, uh, one, one of the big banks in America that started the credit card system, which basically started the whole process of allowing people to get things that they couldn't afford. And I just watched a National Geographic episode around the oldest man in the world is 109. And one of the things he said that really stuck with me was that everything he's ever bought, he's bought with the money he had in his pocket. Yes, and, and you know, it's very interesting that you say that because I remember um, I was a clothes designer for a while and this was, I, I had to close my shop in 19, in uh, 10 years ago. So when was that? 2010. Uh, I closed my shop. I was manufacturing in India, and I got really shafted by by uh, by the manufacturing system there. And then I moved my tailoring, and then I was one of those people that jumped on that made in England. So I had tailors in England. I was making fabric here and all of that. And so you know, and then eventually I had to um, shut it all down, which was a great relief actually. Again, because I thought it was what I wanted to do, and it was just oh god, it was so stressful. Um, but but. Um, at that point, I was in so much debt. And I remember speaking to a business manager, a friend of mine put me in touch with his business manager. And, and he taught me how never to do anything without using my own money. You know, no, don't use debt. Do not live on capital. Do not, do not live on capital. Do not live on credit. But work with what's coming in. So start small, work with what's coming in and build with what's coming in. So if you've, if you've got to go into debt and if you've got to borrow and you've, if, even if you've got to get somebody else, to, I personally would never let anyone else invest in what I'm doing because then I've got to give them half the money. I don't want to do that. Mm. Mm. I own what I do. You know, I remember making DVDs in the 2000s and 14s. I started making DVDs and I went to different companies and said, look, I want to make DVDs as a yoga teacher. And they all said, yes, but you can't do this and you can't do that. And I just said, fuck it, I'll do my own. So I did. And I made DVDs that I put on Amazon, on Fulfillment by Amazon, Amazon Prime. I still sell DVDs that I made in 2015. Um, And I own all of it because I didn't use anyone else's money. At that point, I used debt. But now what I do is I don't have any debt. I don't even have a credit card because it's too stressful mm. i do what i do based on the money i have if i don't have the money don't do it i want your knowledge downloaded <laughs> into a computer so that young <laughs> new entrepreneurs i'm not going to say young entrepreneurs but new entrepreneurs uh, can understand some of the lessons that you're, you you've said there one of the key things i want to highlight again that you've just said there is about debt i'm an angel investor i've actually invested in businesses but one of the things i always say to people before i invest is are you sure you need money from anybody else because if yeah. you don't it's much better to do it on your own and the other thing i hear from a lot of people i just did a video on this like six ways you can start a business with no money because most people think they need a load of money to start a business they absolutely don't so just making people understand you know work with what's coming in start mm-hmm. small Enjoy mm-hmm. the process. Don't try to rush it. And I think that you'll have a happier business if you're more in control of it. And, yeah. and so, you know, your, your experience there and your point there is something I, I, I just I absolutely love and want to highlight. Now, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time. And I, I'd like to end with this one question. Actually, I've never wanted to ask this question more of you uh, than anyone else, I've, I've, I've asked this question every time at the end of my podcast, but for some reason, this question really, really sticks with me as the right question for you, which is, if you went back to your younger self, and I kind of want to pick like the 21-year-old that uh, had that moment, 
and you give any advice as to when, where you are now, if you went back to that 21 year old, what advice would you be giving? I love that question. You know, it, it is interesting because I look back on all the things that I did and what happened and how difficult I was and how, how traumatized I was and how angry and how incredibly unmanageable I was as a person. You know, if I went back, I could probably diagnose myself with borderline personality disorder. I was a drug addict. I was a maniac. I was very funny. I was very, you know, I was very lucky. I was. I was in the right moments, in the right times. I don't think now I'd change a thing. I don't think I'd change a thing. I'm just really glad of every, every mad moment that I went through because I'm still having the most extraordinary life. So I think if I went back, I don't think I'd change anything. I think I would just trust the process more. But then I think if I trusted the process more, I probably wouldn't have done what I did. Hmm. It's a very interesting end to a fantastic conversation. I want to thank you for your time. I would like to sum up what I've taken away from our okay. chat today um, in case people don't have a chance to listen to the whole thing. Maybe they could just take away these, these, these few things. Um, I want to reiterate what we just talked about, which is work with what you've got coming in and, and perhaps enjoy the process of building something up slowly. Um, ask someone for film. They might just give it to you. <laughs> yes. You have to listen to the whole podcast to understand what I mean by that one. Um, see opportunity in the universe. It sounds very mystic. I'm, I'm a very practical person. I'm actually married to a kinesiologist. So ah. I'm, I'm, I'm always um, open to new ways of thinking. But see the opportunity in the universe. I think if people really think about that. And sometimes even with coronavirus, there, 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 there is there's something you're being told right now about what you're meant to be doing. Um, and if you listen carefully enough, you, you, yeah. you will see it. So if you're in a job you hate, you've had a chance to stop be with your family and maybe you realizing it write that letter of resignation or that email and make a change because listen to the universe i really like that don't do drink or do drugs <laughs> we'll we say that when we're older but when you wouldn't go back to your 21 year old and tell tell yourself not to do those things so i'm not oh, quite sure no, so so it's interesting so i'm not sure do drugs and, and drink no no no, no no we're not saying that if you're suicidal, don't do MDMA because that's the worst. Right. If you're depressed, don't do MDMA. That's fair. I think that's fair. So st we'll yeah. stick with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> work out your skills, I think, is another great bit of advice. A lot of people don't spend enough time figuring out what they're actually good at and practicing at that and getting good at that, even better at that, as opposed to always trying to fix your flaws. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm also not good at accounts. I've always hired good accountants and I'm not going to go on an accounts course anytime soon. So, okay. uh, so I think working out your skills, uh, free is powerful. Um, I'm actually going to grab a sentence out of one of the videos that you said, which I really like, which is being in touch with the power of your own story. Um, mm. So if people have to go listen to one of your videos to understand what I mean by that. Um, but I think that's something you said in one of your videos that really resonates with me. And I, I love this whole idea of thinking about business models that are inclusive, not necessarily exclusive. Although I like an element of exclusivity in things. So it's tailored to the 1000 people that are going to get the benefit from what you're doing. But I, I love the idea that you can try to make things inclusive by perhaps thinking about free in a positive, positive way. So that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate but it. I'm so grateful that you asked me. It's lovely to talk to you because you've got this fantastic possibility energy. Oh, that's you nice of you to say. This field that just like anything, just anything is possible. And I love that. Oh, that's very kind of you. Yeah, I, I do think anything is possible. And uh, the fact that I've managed to get you to come on my podcast show <laughs> kind of proves it. You're very charming. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. All right. Nice to speak to you. Thank you. Really, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Good Luck Club podcast. We know you have thousands of podcasts you could be listening to and you've chosen us. We, of course, feel lucky. If you want to hear more, please go to thegoodluckpod.com or go to any of our social media pages and share with us your views, your insights and any way that we can improve what we're doing to make it a better experience for you. We wish you the best of luck.